of you are excited for the word of God this morning? How many of you know and believe that the word of God is all that we need? The word of God is powerful. The word of God brings transformation. Come on. The word of God brings renewal. The word of God brings restoration. The word of, the word of God brings security to the body of Christ and to all the believers here. So before I start off, uh, start off, I would like to just say one story. So there was this story about this young man who had pain all over his body. And then he decided that he wanted to go to see to the doctor. And he went to the doctor and he told the doctor, Doctor, you know, my entire body is in pain. And the doctor was like, entire body? You mean every part of your body is in pain? And he said, yes, doctor. And the doctor asked him, how do you know that it's in pain? How, you know, how do you test it out? And he said, you know, every time I take my finger, I test it out, I feel very pain. And then the doctor was like, wow, this is a bit weird. It's, uh, you know, very surprising. Okay, let's test it out. So he asked the young man, okay, why don't you take your finger and touch your head? Ouch, it's painful, he said. Okay, why don't you, t you test, you put it on your cheek. Ouch, it's painful, he said. Oh, what about your neck? What about your chest? What about your stomach? Ouch, oh, painful. The doctor looked at him. Okay, why don't you touch your knees? Oh, it's still painful, doctor. And the doctor looked at him and said, you fool, you got a dislocated finger. See, the problem with us sometimes is there's probably there's this one thing in our life that keeps bothering us. That this one thing that keeps appearing in our life and it, it, it kind of destroys us, it kind of ruins our life. And today, there's this story in the Bible that's very, very similar in the Bible. There's this story in the Old Testament, one of the most famous story in the Testament, Old Testament. If you are from Sunday school, then you know what I'm talking about. This is a story of David and Goliath from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Alright, David and Goliath is one of the most famous story. How many of you know this story very well? But today what we're going to do is, the young boy is coming to the front. What we're going to do here today is, hello. What we're going to do here today is we are going to un unpack the scripture in a whole different angle. Is that okay? We are going to, we're going to see the story of David and Goliath in a whole different uh, picture, alright? So today, my title for my today's sharing will call Slaying the Goliaths in Our Life. Come on. Slaying the Goliaths or Slaying the Giants in Our Life. Now, before we go on, alright? Is that okay? I straight away jump to the Word of God. Now, before we go on, we need to understand the anatomy of a Goliath. A Goliath is a circumstances or a situation, a pain or a problem that looms very large. And most of the time, the Goliaths in our life causes major difficulties in our life. Alright? And it could be a Goliath of fear. It could be a Goliath of addiction. It could be a Goliath of financial crisis. It could be a Goliath of, 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 of discouragement and hopelessness. Now, all these things that I just mentioned to you, right? It can either detour you, destroy you, or break you. Am I right? So this is the anatomy of a Goliath. We need to understand uh, uh, who is this enemy is. And then we are told in 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 4, 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 4, that Goliath is about 9 feet and 6 inch tall. Now look at me everybody. I am 6 feet tall, right? Some of you consider me as tall. But here can you imagine another dude that is 9 feet and 6 inch tall and he's not that slim, yo. How do we know that? Because the scripture says that, you know what? He carries an armor on top of him that weighs about 100 pounds. 100 pounds is about what? 49 kg, Kevin? 48 kg, 49 kg, around the 100 pounds. And in order to carry 100 pounds on him, he must have weighed triple than that. So we have 9 feet, 6 inch tall dude weighing about 300 pounds. Now, this is the Goliath that the Israelites were facing. This Goliath right, intimidates the people, the Israelites. This Goliath stands in front of them and humiliates them. This Goliath that was in front of them make the Israelites feel so small. They feel defeated. Even, even, even before getting into the war, they saw this 9 feet and 6 inch and 300 pound guy. They were like, are you already defeated? How many of you, when some problem comes, some Goliaths appear in your life, even before you could do, uh, you know, you, you know uh, pray, or even before you could do anything, you already feel defeated. Come on, am I talking to somebody this morning? And here we see that the Goliath is often time, you know, you know, looking at them, the Israelite, and when the Goliath looks at the Israelite, it produces an insecurity, uh, sorry, it produces an emotional insecurity in the lives of the people of Israelite. What is this emotional insecurity? It's fear. 
It seems like that when the people Israelites saw Goliath, you know what happened here is they feel that their emotions are being controlled by Goliath. They are no longer in control of how they feel because this big giant here, he controls the emotions of your life. How many of you feel that your financial crisis, your brokenness, your problem seems to be controlling you? But my friend, I have a good news. You know how this story ends. Let me get that later on. So here, this, this Goliath is calling out their names and making fun of them because you know why? The Israelites were very, very fearful. Now the problem with this Goliath is that it just won't go away. Pastor? In the Bible, we see that every morning and every night, every morning and every night in verse, uh, 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 we can see that, you know, in every morning, every night, he will appear and he will stand in front of the Goliath. Uh, the Goliath stands in front of the people, the children of Israelite. 40 days, 40 nights. And probably there are times that he feels that he needs to go to the toilet, he'll go to the toilet and the Israelites will be like, hey, the Goliath is gone. And but he comes up again and then they go back into the hiding. Whenever Goliath goes away, they're happy, but then 40 days, 40 nights, night and day, he stands there. And he's laughing at the people of Israelite. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. You have lost. I'm standing here. I'm powerful than you. I am bigger than you. And he makes fun of that. Now my question to you this morning is very, very simple. We are getting to somewhere right now, right? My question to you to the floor right now is very, very simple. How did David actually kill the Goliath? Probably you will say, Pastor, David killed Goliath, you know, with five stone and a slingshot. Probably you're right, but that's just partially correct. Today, I'm going to come, I'm going to bring some theological approach, not very deep, but very shallow, you know, very simple theological approach for you to understand what did David actually did before the slingshot, before the stone, what kind of strategy did he use to defeat the Goliaths in his life? Come on, somebody say amen, please. Now, the goal of the scripture is not just to read and hear it. The goal of the scripture is to what? Utilize it and also apply it. You see, when you just read the scripture and hear it, it's good. I'm not saying it's not good, it's good. But when the moment when you utilize the scripture and when you apply it in your daily life, that's when it becomes double power. So today, we are going to be utilizing and also applying what did David do so that we can apply it in our daily life. Hello, come on, somebody wave your hand at me, please. Now, let's get a little bit deeper. David, let's see how did David actually deal and defeat the overwhelming Goliaths in his life. Now, in order to understand scripture, right, there's, there's a lot of methods. One of the methods is to look out for repetition. What does it mean? It means if a word that's being used more than once in a single text, in a single event, it means that we have to pay a close attention to it. Okay? Repetition because it means that there is something. There's some revelation there. There's something that can be unpacked here. Now, let's look at verse 26, please. Verse 26. Mm. Come. Then David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away... Hey, wait, wait. Okay, all right. Oh, it's a new system, is it? Takes away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should define the armies of the Lord? Now, let's look at verse 36 now, right? 10 verse after that, all right? Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like the one of them seeing he has defined, defeated the armies of the living God. Now, as I was reading verse 26 and 36, what word that seems to be repeating? Very good. You got it, sister. The word uncircumcised Philistine was repeated twice. Now, if you're underlining that word, underline that word. But make sure, make sure someone else doesn't take your Bible. Because when they take the Bible, they see, why this guy only underlined the word uncircumcised? It doesn't make sense. Okay, now we're getting somewhere, all right? Now, the author, David, now described the Goliath <laughs> as an uncircumcised Philistine in verse 36. Because Goliath is not circumcised, now the nature of the battle has changed. Has changed now. I will tell you why. I will tell you why. Everybody here, they were afraid, they were hiding, and they were looking at this big, huge guy. Wow, look at him. Nine feet, six inch, 300 pounds. But David was looking at the bottom. This guy has not been to the doctor. This guy has still his foreskin attached to him. 
David had a different perspective than the children of Israel. I know you're, you're thinking, what he's trying to say? Wait, I'm coming, I'm coming, all right? Turn to your neighbor and say, he's coming, he's coming. Now, in order to defeat the Goliaths in your life, number one, you need to start with a spiritual perspective of the problem. Let me just repeat that one more time. You need to start with a spiritual perspective of the problem. If all that you are looking and seeing is the visible and not the invisible, then you will fail to, to see the invisible spiritual cause of the visible physical problem. What did I just say? Can I just repeat that? If all that you see is the visible and not the invisible, then you will fail to see the invisible spiritual cause of your visible physical problem. There are times that sometimes we need to understand what is the spiritual cause behind the Goliaths that we are facing. Now here, David sees this boy, this guy, and he was like, this boy is just a little boy because he is uncircumcised and I am circumcised. My friend, you need to understand this. You know, before the slingshot and the stone, there was a shift in his perspective, just like the, just like the story of a mother and a son. The son lost his contact lens. And he went out and he finds his contact lens and he couldn't find it. He came back home, he told his mother, Mom, I've lost my contact lens, Mom. You know, for one hour I've been searching for it, I can't find. And the mother was like, wait here, let me go and find. The mother went, two minutes, came back, here is your contact lens. And the boy was like, Mom, how do you do that? I searched for one hour, you two minutes. And the mother said, I don't care whether you can see or not, but I was searching for 200 ringgit. Because that's the amount of money that I purchased the content lens for you. A different perspective causes us to search such more deeply because a different perspective. Today, David in the Bible, he had a different perspective than the children of Israel. Like, oh, oh, so big. Oh, so you. <laughs> David was like, it's okay. Uncircumcised. I will tell you why it is so important that time. Now, let's get a little bit deeper. Turn your neighbor and say, let's get a little bit deeper. What is it beyond, uh, being uncircumcised then? What's the difference? What's the, what's the beauty about it here? Okay, now circumcision in Israel is a sign of a covenant. Every young boy in Israel, in the Old Testament, you'll find that as soon as they reach eight year old, they have to be circumcised. Why? It's so that they can be in, stay with me, so that they can be in and under the covenant. So David, he was probably about 15 year old here now. About 15, 16 year old in his youth. Confirm already circumcised. Confirm he's in and under the covenant. And he's like looking at Goliath. Goliath, you are uncircumcised. It means you are not under the covenant of the Lord. Whereas I am in the covenant of the Lord. My friend, let me tell you something. All the Goliaths in your life, all the problem and all the challenges in your life, they are not under the covenant of the Lord. And they have no power over you. Come on, people of God, let's give God the glory, please. Now, what does a covenant mean? A covenant means divinely ordained relational bound. How do you like that? The meaning of covenant means divinely ordained relational bond. Probably you're sitting here and you're like, ah, but what about us, Pastor? But I'm not circumcised. Huh? Let me tell you a story. No, let me tell you something from the truth of God. There are five major covenants in the Bible. Number one, there is the Noah, Noahic covenant made with Noah, Abrahamic covenant, we got the Moses covenant, we got the Davidic covenant made with David, and then we got the new covenant. And we all fall under the new covenant of God, which means we are the children of the covenant. Come on, people of God. You may say, Pastor, I'm not like David. I am not from Israel. I'm not a Jew, my friend. But you are under the new covenant of God. The new covenant talks about forgiveness of sin. The new covenant talks about restoration. The new covenant talks about victory. The new covenant talks about the identity and the authority that you have in Christ Jesus. And now you no longer sit on a normal place, but you sit in the heavenly realms. Come on! That's what it means to be under the covenant. But here, pastor, there's a trick here. You can be in the covenant, yet not operating under the covenant. Everybody in Israel, Saul and his brothers, probably they are the ones who went to houses, houses and cutting people's skin. They were all circumcised. They were in the covenant. 
but they were not operating under the covenant. We all can be in the covenant, but if you don't understand the power of the covenant that we have between us and God, your life is going to be different. Unless that you understand how to walk under the covenant. Ha, ah, boy! Let me tell you, it's like carrying an umbrella when it's raining. A covenant, what does it mean? A covenant, what's the goal of a covenant? To cover, covenant cover. To cover you. Today, if it's raining, all I need to do is to take the umbrella, open, and what happens is I am protected, I am covered. Listen carefully. When the rain comes, I take the umbrella, open the umbrella, does the rain stop? The rain did not stop, but I not I am not getting wet. The rain may still be there. The challenges will come, Buster. Goliaths will come. Enemies will come. But I am operating under the covenant. It may rain, but I am not getting wet. I may be pushed aside, but I am not crushed. I may have financial crisis, but I can still smile. I may have problems, but I can still worship God. Come on, people who are under the covenant, make some noise. We are under the covenant of God. You see, when you operate under the covenant, I like this, we're getting somewhere now. When you operate under the covenant, you don't run away from Goliath. But you confront them. How do I know? David was taking care of the flocks. The bears will come. Did David hide? He did not hide. The scripture indicates that he ran towards the bear and he slaughtered and he tear them apart and he killed the bear. The lions will come and lay in. And David didn't hide himself under the blanket. But he go, he chase after the lion. And now you find that the Goliaths are, is here now. People are hiding. He's the only dude who is full of confidence and authority came before that nine feet guy. Those who operate under the covenant, you won't, you won't run away, but you will stand before the problem and you say, you uncircumcised fellow, you are not under the covenant. I am under the covenant of God and I have all the power and authority because God has given me all the power and authority and the one who lives inside is me, ah, is much more greater than the one that is outside. Come on. He was operating under the covenant. See, when you operate under the covenant, you are not on the defense mode, but you are on the offense mode. When you operate under the covenant, you're like, devil, whatever you want to do, you do. Whatever you want to throw at me, you throw at me. I am not in the mode of playing defense, but I am in the mode, in the season, and in the mood of being in the offense because you know why? The battle does not belong to me, but the battle belongs to the Lord. I am on the offense mode. I'm going to take you down with the help, with the grace, and with the strength of God. Today, how many giant slayers are there in the house? Come on. Turn to your name and say, I'm a giant slayer. Matthew 16 verse 9. Why do you say giant slayer and look at your wife? No, no, I'm joking, joking, joking. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. No, no, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm just joking. You're joking, Pastor. Chill, huh? relax. Matthew 16 verse 19. Let me have you on the screen. Matthew 16 verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth ha, ha, will be bound in heaven. And what? Whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. Now the contemporary, contemporary interpretation of this is very simple. Unless you move, the heaven won't move. When you move, the heaven move. How many of you remember the song that we sang? We need to move. Oh, what? That was prophetic. I didn't know that Jared was going to choose this song. I didn't know that Pastor uh, Jared was going to choose. But then, it aligned to what I'm preaching today. Now, turn to your neighbor and say, it. when you move, heaven moves. Come on. Point number two. In order to defeat the Goliaths in our life, you need to move. You need to move. Now, how, how, how? Does it make sense? Is this scriptural? Scriptural? Is this based in the Bible? Yes, let me tell you a story. How many of you remember the story of Moses? When he was there uh, in the Red Sea, God did not just part the blessing just like that. God told Moses, take up your stick and put it. There was something that David, David, uh, uh, Moses had to do. How many of you remember the walls of Jericho? The people did not sit at home and watch Netflix all day long. No, they went, they marched around the walls of Jericho. They sang praises, they give thanks to the Lord. They were blowing trumpets, making noise, joyful noise. And then the walls come down. My friend, many Christians, we are here. We are telling God, God do this, God do that. My friend, there are things that we got to do. We have to do what is possible and God will do what is impossible. It's a story of a, I've been telling a lot of story. There's a story about a young man who is very afraid of the dark. 
And the mother told the boy, boy, I want you to go outside and lock the gate. It was night, about 10 o'clock. He ran to the door and he looked at the gate. It was so dark. He was so scared. He went back to the mother. Mom, I'm very afraid. The mom said, no, let's go. Please go lock the gate. And he ran out. Being a Christian, you know what he did? Let's pray. God, would you come and lock the gate? The mother heard the prayer, take the broom and throw on his head. <laughs> Whose job is to lock the gate? God or you? There are things that we have to do. But we are asking God to do the things that we got to do. That's the reason why we feel, God, you are not moving. God, you are not moving. My friend, you got to take the first step. The first step that the boy needs to do is what? Is to face his fear. God, I am going to do this. And then you realize God will take over him. No, God is not going to lock the gate. But I'm not saying that God can't do that. He can do that. But what I'm trying to say is, you got to make the first step. And then the Lord will take the rest of the step. The prodigal son, remember? He thought to himself, I got to go back to my father. He came and he saw his father from afar. First step, he took. And the father saw that he took the first step. The father took another 10 step. You do the possible and let God do the impossible. Most of the time, we are asking God to do the possible. And God will be like, boy, you can do it, man. God, I want to lose weight. Please help me to lose weight. Tomorrow I sleep. Tomorrow morning I wake up. Poop, 10 kg gone. My friend, you will not have 10 kg gone. Probably you have another 10 kg added up to you. What is the possible? Go to the gym. Go to Akila Fitness. I'm promoting you. Right? The possible thing. Do the possible and God will do the impossible. Come on, people of God. Say amen, please. Now, the second thing we learned that you need to move. The third one and then we are done. The third thing in order to defeat the Goliaths in your life, you need to have a spiritual strategy. <sighs> now, it's getting, it's getting more nicer now, right? Spiritual strategy. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6. Have you on the screen? Proverbs 24, verse 6. For by wise counsel, you will wage your own war. But in multitude of counselor, there is safety. Now, stay there, wait. Let's go at Psalms 25, verse 14 now. Psalms 25, verse 14. Come, let's sit together. One, two, three. Shh. Can I tell you a secret? Shh. The Lord has a secret for you. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him and He will show them His what? We learn this now? His covenant. Does it make sense? Now, what I'm trying to say here is when you face the Goliaths in your life, God will give you strategy, spiritual strategy how to pull down the giants in your life. And oftentimes, this secret that God shares to you, it could be very personal and it's meant for you for a given situation at the given season. That's the reason why sometimes when God speaks to you about certain strategy for you to defeat your Goliath, that strategy might not work for someone else. Remember, when David was about to defeat Goliath, Saul said, now nah, take my armor, now nah, take my sword, now nah, take my javelin. And you know what? This is not the secrets of the Lord. This is not my strategy. This is not the strategy that God has given me. That's the strategy probably God has given to Saul. But David had a whole different strategy. Come on. All his strategy was, oh, five stone and a slingshot. I can defeat this uncircumcised Philistine. We all need a spiritual strategy from God. And let, let me tell you something. God will give you divine thoughts and strategy on what you should do in the particular situation. Financial crisis, he will give you a strategy for that. Marriage breakdown, he will give you a strategy for that. You want to move forward in ministry, he will give you a strategy for that. Today, those who are watching online and those who are here today, God is giving you divine strategy to defeat the Goliaths in your life. Come on. It's like having a rule book and a playbook. Now, let me teach you something here. A rule book is a set of rules that everyone will abide to it. For example, in the football, in FIFA, in football, everybody has a rule book. Every team has to abide in their rule because that's the rule under the FIFA organization. But every team has its own playbook. Every team has its own strategy book how to defeat the opponent. My friend, when you walk under the covenant... When you spend time in the Lord, when you understand that you got to move, the Lord will give you a playbook, strategies, secrets, steps that you need to do in order to succeed in your life. 
Today, many men and women of God who is so successful, not just in, 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 in financial, I'm saying successful in the ministry, successful in their maturity in Christ Jesus because they all draw strategies and revelation from God. You know, I believe that our pastor does that whenever he wants to do church, whenever he wants to do something for, you know, ministry or even a meeting, he will always pray first before he starts. Even a five-minute meeting, he will say, come, let's pray first. Because you know why? He understands divine strategy is all that we need. Man's strategy may work, but he will fail. Man's strategy will fail, but God's strategy lasts forever. And it's for you. Turn your neighbor and say, God has a strategy for you. Now, now let's see what strategy that God gave David. Right then, we are done. Uh, uh, Adam, you can get on the keyboard. Now, let's see what strategy did, did God gave David. In verse 45. 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. I love this. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord, the God of armies. Some other version was it? Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts, God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Now, listen to this. When the moment when David said this, there was a shift in the nature of the battle. Before that, the worst before that, the Philistines were said, Goliath and the people were said, you think what? I'm a dog, is it that you come? You're a small boy. You think what? I'm a dog. And they began to curse the God of Israel. David was like, this is the best time. You call me a dog? You curse my God? The moment when you curse my God, the battle is no longer between me and you. The battle now is between God and you. Ah, David had a shift there. Come on. He was like, no, I'm not fighting this battle for you. The moment you condemn my God, the moment that you ridicule my God, the moment when you humiliate me, the battle is not between me and you, but the battle is between the God of all armies and you. My friend, the Goliath that you face in your life, God is fighting the battle for you. He has the power and he has the strategy to give to you to overcome this battle in your life. There was a shift in the nature of the battle. And second thing, what did David did was he identified God's name. You know what he said? God of armies. Lord of hosts. And a very appropriate name, Pastor, for an appropriate situation. He began to identify an appropriate name of God in that given situation. There are about 85 different names of God in the Bible. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, El Shaddai, and all this, a lot of them. And here David is quoting a lot of hosts, God of army, because now he's in a war. And he's not going to say anything else, but he began to identify God's name. What is the problem that you are going through this morning? Are you going through financial crisis? If you are going through financial crisis, probably you need to say, Jehovah Chire. If you're going through pain in your body, probably you need to say, Jehovah Rapha, you are my healer. El Shaddai, you are God Almighty. Come on, people of God. In order to understand the name of the Lord, you need to be under the covenant. You need to spend time with the Lord. And when you spend time in the Lord, you will begin to know the names of the Lord. Oh, my friend, how many of you, how many of you know how this story ends? The story ends by Goliath being defeated God of all hosts David said you come with me all you can my friend the devil can throw whatever he wants all you need to do is devil I'm not teaching you to talk to him alright please just an explanation but how come we do with the name of the most glorious powerful name we may be in pandemic but you are my protector I may go through challenges in my life but you are the God who never leaves nor forsake me. How many of you know the Bible said that the enemy is like a what? A roaring lion. A toothless lion. Because you know why? He can only ah, you but he cannot eat you up. Because you know why? The real lion comes from the tribe of Judah. 
And his name is Jesus Christ. That's the reason why the Bible said he is just like a roaring lion because the real lion comes from the tribe of Judah and that's the name of our God, Jesus Christ. Come on. And when the moment David came, five stones. I wish I can do a second series of this to talk about the five stones. Five stones and a sling or only one stone. Maybe the other four stones were his brothers. We don't like his brothers. Four brothers there. No, I'm just joking. Simple strategy. Identify the name. A strategy. Now, when you throw someone, throw a stone on someone's forehead, what happens? Probably a big stone. Let's say a big stone. But he throws a small stone. Huh? You throw a big stone and throw what happens? They will fall this way. But here is David, uh, Goliath falling face down. Every high thing needs to come down. And they will, no longer, they will not go backwards, but they will come frontwards because they are saying, I'm sorry that I have attacked you. I'm sorry that I've chosen the wrong house. I'm sorry that I've came to the wrong family. I'm sorry that I've knocked on the wrong door. My friend, the Goliath that's knocking in your door, they have came to the wrong house. They have came to the wrong channel. My friend, because you are operating under the covenant, the devil is afraid of you. Come on. People of God, in this pandemic, in this season, we cannot be fearful. We need to rise up and say, no matter what happens, I will still stand strong in the Lord because I am a children of a covenant. The children of a covenant, they are not timid. They are not scared. They are going to do whatever you want. I will stand strong because my God is strong. Come on, stand up to your feet, please. How many of you are blessed by the word? El Olam, everlasting God. Jehovah Sabot, the Lord of hosts. El Shaddai, God Almighty. He is our God. Come on, lift up one of your hands to Jesus, please. I forgot to call the worship team. Worship team, come. Busy slaying lions. Giants, I think, at the back. Thank you, Lord. Come on, giant slayers. Lift up one of your hands to Jesus. If you're watching this at home, God is bringing breakthrough to you. Addiction, addiction. I just, I just see the word addiction keep coming. Some of you feel that this addiction is standing in front of you. And they are humiliating you and calling out your name and making fun of you, saying that you are guilty, you are sinful, you are dirty, you are smelly and all these things. But the Lord is saying, I'm giving you grace, my son. I'm giving you strategy to overcome this. The greatest strategy is to rely on the blood of Jesus. Some of you are watching this at home, at home. Marriage broken, broken marriage. Arguments and misunderstanding. And you are in the verge of doing something that you don't want to do. The Lord is saying, hang in there. Hang in there. There is a spiritual cause at the back of it. The problem is not with your husband. The problem is not with your wife. There, there is another problem. There's another problem looming large in your, in your family. But I, the Lord, will cause you, cause you to, I will give you new strategy to overcome it. I will give you strategy to identify those things. And you will find the root and the cause of it. And the Lord is going to bring an inner healing that will come between you and your husband. There is a move. Come on, just focus on Jesus. The Lion of Judah is in the house. The Lion of Judah is in your household. El Shaddai, God Almighty. The name above every other name. Most powerful and glorious name. Jesus, he is the Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. The most powerful and the most glorious one. No one comes before him and no one comes after him. He is sovereign. <laughs> he is powerful. Come on. He is a God that heals. He is a God that protects. He is the God that watches over you. He is the God who blesses you. He is the God who never leaves you nor forsake you. He is our Father. He is our King. He is our Shepherd. He is our salvation. Come on. God is my deliverance. God is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The name of the Lord and you are the children of the new covenant. And you are entitled 
to enjoy all the benefits that comes under His name. Ah! You are entitled and qualified to enjoy the benefits that comes under His name. Let me just pray for you, God. I pray for your people. Watch over them. Watch their going and their coming, Father. In this pandemic, you will protect them, Father. In this pandemic, Lord, your children will prosper. They will prosper. Their business will prosper. Their marriage will prosper. Their family will prosper. Everyone and anyone who is connected to them, they too will prosper, Father. We bless you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.